good evening to one and all i am shruti sb s2 mcom gbs student department of commerce university of kerala welcome to the ninth session of online nta net jrf coaching program organized by commerce club department of commerce university of kerala in today's session we'll be dealing with the paper 2 topic legal aspects of business and for this it's my privilege to welcome dr anisha p chelapen post doctor fellow of department of commerce university of kerala under the guidance of dr gabriel simon tattle professor and head department of commerce university of kerala dean faculty of commerce and director iqac university of kerala dr anisha p chelapen has completed her bachelor's masters of commerce and b.e. from various institutions under mg university she took mphil from university of kerala and successfully cleared ugc net exam during that period she has published papers in more than 10 journals she took her phd in 2019 under the guidance of dr k s suresh kumar professor distance school of education university of kerala so once again i extend my warm welcome to dr anisha pichalappan and all the participants on my personal behalf and all the commerce club members to this session and now i welcome you ma'am to take over today's session over to you thank you and a very good evening to one and all today i am going to discuss with the ninth ninth unit of your uh, subject part which is legal aspects of business and the uh, syllabus covers various uh, business regulatory um, laws regarding um, uh, indian uh, contract act uh, legal uh, sorry indian contract act special contracts um, and uh, sale of goods act uh, negotiable instrument act uh, the companies act and uh, limited liability partnership competition act uh, information technology act uh, right to information act and so on um, as you know this is a, a wide topic so uh, i just give you an uh, overview of the session overview of the topic and you you need to prepare well um, about the topic and uh, each and every topic of this uh, syllabus need more time for the discussion so i just give you only an orientation keep in mind that let me start with my um, topic on legal aspects of business in the first uh, uh, law regarding this is the indian contract act 1872 um before uh, discussing about the act contract act let me uh, give some terms with the, related to it is the which is the base of the contract and the first one is proposal and every <clears throat> as you know that every contract needs some proposal and the, this proposal uh, when we are uh, giving an offer offer or proposal which is synonymously used when we are giving an offer to another one another person uh, they may or may not accept it when the proposal is accepted it will become the promise and the promise need some consideration need some um, something in return which is consideration and the promise plus consideration leads to an agreement and uh, um mere agreement is a not a contract or all agreement is not contract but uh, the agreement is enforceable by law which will become the contract an agreement can be enforceable by law is uh, it will become the contract so and this this sequential mode uh, this this sequence is also um, asked in the previous exam uh, it's a previous question which is uh the sequence of the uh, order of these um terms which itself is um, asked by uh, ugc in the previous exam next and uh, the meaning and definition of contract section 2h of the indian contract act 1872 defines a contract is an agreement enforceable by law so contract 
is equal to an agreement plus enforceability of an agreement. And uh, uh, when we come to agreement, it's I already tell you that is uh, it's an offer or proposal plus acceptance of the order offer. Then enforceability. Enforceability is an agreement is said to be an enforceable by law if it creates some legal obligations. It is called the enforceability. And uh, uh, there is some usual presumptions like uh, uh, the contracts, social or domestic agreements are there, and the commercial or business agreements are there. When we uh, come to the social or uh, domestic agreements, that the parties do not intend to create any legal relations. Uh, and in commercial business or business agreement, and that the parties intend to create legal relations. And when a proposal, when accepted, become promise, and every promise and every set of promise forming consideration uh, of for each other is an agreement. So this is uh, a contract. Next, Lakshmi. And the scope of uh, law of contract and the <clears throat> not whole law of agreements. The law of contract is not the whole law of agreement because it is concerned with only those agreements um, where parties have the intention to create legal obligations and is not concerned with those agreements where parties do not have the intention to create legal obligations. And the law of contract is not the whole law of obligation because it is concerned with only those obligations which arise out of agreements and is not concerned with those obligations which do not arise out of agreements. And classification of contracts, which is a very uh, important. And uh, on the basis of creation, on the basis of execution, on the basis of <coughs> enforceability, there are <coughs> different types of contracts. <coughs> and uh, the on the basis of creation, uh, there are three types of contract. The first one is express contract. One which is made uh, by words spoken or written which is express contract because, um, for example, uh, X says to Y to buy my car for uh, two, four rupees one lakh and Y and then Y says to uh, X, I am ready to buy your car for rupees one lakh and it is an express contract by, made by orally, made orally. And uh, there is also an implied contract, one which is which made otherwise than by words spoken or written. It is implied. There is no need for uh, a written or spoken um, through this contract. And uh, the another one is tacit contract, one which is inferred from the conduct of parties or circumstances of the case. This type of a contract, uh, for example, when uh, we are uh, withdrawing cash through ATM, this is a tacit contract. And the next one is on the basis of execution. There are uh, some contracts that is executed contract, executory contract, partly executed, partly executory, unilateral contract, and uh, so on. And the first one is executed contract where both the parties to the contract have performed their respective obligations. Both the parties to the contract have performed their uh, respective obligations. That type of contract is executed a contract. For example, uh, uh, X offers his uh, car to sell, uh, sell to Y for rupees uh, 1 lakh and Y accept X offer. And X delivers the car to Y and Y pays rupees 1 lakh to X. It is an executed contract. There are uh, because both the parties of the contract have performed their respective obligations. Here, X offer uh, to Y uh, for um, giving his car to Y, and both both of them were uh, agreed to perform their respective obligations. It is executed contract, and the next one is executory contract. <coughs> where both the parties to the contract have still to perform their uh, respective obligations, uh, which is, uh, that is, uh, for example, X offers to sell his car to Y for rupees 1 lakh, and Y accept X offer. And if the car has not yet been delivered uh, by X, and the price has not been paid by Y, it is an executory contract. The offer and acceptance 
is already happened but the execution is uh, not uh, not yet been deliberate or not happened that is the executory contract and partly executed or partly executory where one party one of the parties to the contract has performed his obligation and the other party has still to perform his obligation uh, one of the party has performed and the other one is not performed his ex, uh, his duty or uh, his perform not executed his obligation that is the partly executed and partly executory and the um, next one is unilateral contract one in which uh, only one party has to perform his uh, promise or obligation to do for beer and <clears throat> here uh, the uh, here only one uh, party has to perform his promise uh, to do and the next one is bilateral contract a bilateral contract is one which both parties have to perform their respective obligations next on the basis of enforceability this is very important on the basis of enforceability a contract can be valid void void voidable illegal or unenforceable contract um first with the uh, valid contract which satisfy all the conditions prescribed by law uh, the elements or essential elements of uh, the contract which is at all, all, all the elements satisfies then that type of contract is a valid contract and the next one is a void contract a void contract uh, which was valid when entered into uh, but which is subsequently becomes void due to impossibility of performance due to change of law or any other reason um, for example um, x offers to y uh, y to marry her and y accept x offer and later on uh, <clears throat> y dies and this contract was valid at the time of uh, entering into the contract but uh, for the later time uh, the party the contractual party or one of the party will uh, a party died so this contract uh, can be executed so it is a void contract in the initial stage in the uh, first uh, stage the contract is in uh, both of the parties were entered into the contract but subsequently it become void due to impossibility of performing of uh, such a, uh, duty and uh, the third one is void agreement and according to section 2g an agreement not enforceable by law is said to be void and such agreements are uh, void up in show which means that they are unenforceable uh, right from the time they are made uh, for example an agreement with a minor uh, or a person of unsound mind is mind is uh, void up in show because a minor or a person of unsound mind is incompetent to be uh, to enter into a contract that is uh, void agreement and the next one is voidable contract an agreement which is enforceable uh, by <clears throat> enforceable by law at the option of one or more of the parties but not at the option of the other or others here uh, an agreement which is enforceable by law which is uh, at the option of one or more parties and not by the other or other others uh, for example um, x threatens to kill y and if he does not uh, sell his house for rupees 1 lakh to y and y sells uh, his house to x and receives payments here y's consent has been obtained by coercion and hence this contract is voidable at the option of y and the aggrieved party the uh, aggrieved party uh, if y decides to avoid the contract he will have to return rupees 1 lakh when he had received from and <clears throat> a such type of uh, contract is voidable contract and the next one is illegal agreement uh, one of the object of considering of which is unlawful that is not a collateral agreement is also become void 
and uh, unenforceable contract is a contract which is actually valid but cannot be enforced because of some technical defect such contract can be enforced in the technical defect is removed that is unenforceable contract next lakshmi Uh, the next is the essential elements of a valid contract. Um, these are the essential elements of valid uh, contract, which is proper offer and its proper acceptance and intention, intention to create legal relationships, capacity of parties, lawful consideration, free consent, lawful object, agreement not expressly declared void, certainty of meaning, possibility of performance, legal formalities. And proper offer and acceptance, there must be at least uh, two parties in, an, in a contract or in an agreement, and one making the offer and the other accepting it. And such offer and acceptance must be valid. And um, the next one is intention to create a legal relationship. Um, there, is, uh, there must be an intention among the parties, uh, parties to create a legal relationship in case of social or domestic uh, agreements the usual presumption is that there is parties do not intend to create any legal relationship but in case of commercial or mercantile uh, relations there there needs a legal relationship and the third one is capacity of parties here the part, parties to an agreement must be competent to uh, the contract because the parties may not uh, be a, a minor or it, it may not be an unsound mind of a person or the capacity of the parties in the agreement uh, that capacity of parties is to be competent for the contract that is the uh, capacity of parties and lawful uh, consideration an agreement must be supported by lawful consideration um, it will be valid it will be a valid contract and the lawful consideration consideration means something in return and x uh, so for example x sells his car to y for rupees 1 lakh and y accept his proposal and here the 1 lakh is the consideration and the next one is free consent and there must be free consent of the parties to the contract um, according to section 14, consent is said to be free when uh, it is uh, not caused by coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation, or mistake, which will, uh, with all these uh, terms, I will discuss later. And uh, that is free consent. And the next is a lawful object. The object of the agreement must be lawful according to section 23 of the indian contract act uh, 18 uh, contract act the object is considered lawful unless it is forb forbidden by law or is fraudulent or involves or implies injury to the person or property of another or is immoral or is opposed to the uh, public policy for example x y and z enter into an agreement for the division among them gains acquired to be acquired by them by fraud and the agreement is void because its object is unlawful the object is unlawful then the agreement become void that is lawful object and agreement not expressly uh, declared void uh, the agreement must not have expressly declared void under the provisions of section 24 to 30 of the Indian Contract Act 1872. Under these provisions, agreement is restrained of marriage, agreement uh, in restraint of legal proceedings, agreement in restraint of uh, uh, trade and agreement by way of vague have been expressly declared void. Uh, for example, X and Y carries on a business in, uh, in a particular place and X promised to stop uh, business in that locality if uh, y paid rupees one lakh and x stopped his um, business but y did not pay him the promised money 
it was held that X was not entitled to recover, recover anything because the agreement was restrained of trade and such as void. So the next is certainty of meaning. The term of the agreement must be uh, certain and unambiguous. According to section 29 of the Contract Act 1872 agreements, the meaning of which is not certain or capable of being made certain are void. For example, uh, Ed X, um, X, he is a dealer of different types of oils, uh, agreed to sell um, 100 tons of oils to Y. And this agreement is void on the ground of uncertainty because it is not clear that what kinds of uh, what kinds of oil is intended to uh, be sold. Uh, so the certainty of meaning should be specific. And uh, the next one is possibility of performance. Uh, in terms of the agreement, uh, must be such as are capable of performance. An agreement to do an impossible act is void. For example, um, X agrees to Y to enclose some area between. Uh, sorry, X agrees to Y to disclose, discover a treasure by magic, and Y agrees to pay uh, rupees thousand to X. And this agreement is void because it is an agreement to do uh, an impossible act. So um, this is the possibility of performance. And the next is legal formalities. The agreement must comply with the necessary legal uh, formalities as to writing, registration, stamping, etc. If any required in order um, in order to make it enforceable by law. There are uh, so many legal formalities required for, um, for the um, contract. And these are the essential elements of a valid contract. And the next is consent and a free consent. Um, consent according to section 13, two or more persons are uh, said to consent when they are agree upon the same thing in the same sense. Thus consent involves identity of minds in respect of the subject matter of the contract. In English law, this is called the consensus ad idem and the effect of absence of co uh, consent. Um, then there is no consent at all. The agreement is void of issue that is not enforceable at the option of either party. And um, there is um, next is the free consent. And when a consent is said to be free, when, is, when it is not caused by coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation, mistake, um, misrepresentation and mistake and the effect of uh, absence of a free consent when there is consent but it is not free the uh, contract is usually voidable at the option of the party whose consent was not uh, was so caused and the next next uh, coercion and meaning uh, is that it means that compelling a person to enter into a contract under a pressure or a threat. According to section 15 of the Contract Act, uh, a contract is said to be caused by coercion when it is obtained by um, committing any act which is forbidden by the Indian Penal Code or threatening to commit any act which is uh, forbidden by the Indian Penal Code or unlawful detaining of any property or threatening to detain any property. And the Indian Penal Code need not be forced in place where the coercion is employed. For example, um, X beats Y and compels uh, him to his car for rupees 50,000. And here Y's consent has been obtained by coercion because uh, beating someone is an offense under the uh, Indian Penal Code. That is coercion. Next. Next is undue influence. The term undue influence means dominating the will of the other person to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. According to section 16, one, a contract is said to be induced by undue influence, where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of them 
is in a position to dominate the will of the other and the dominant party uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage. For example, uh, a devotee gifted her property to his uh, to her uh, his or her spiritual guru to secure benefits to uh, her soul in the next world. And it was held that the spiritual guru was the position to dominate the will of the devotee. Next. Next is fraud. The term fraud means the false representation of fact made by a party to a contract willfully with a view to deceive the party, the, deceive the other party and excel to why locally manufactured, manufactured goods and as imported goods and charging a higher price. Uh, it is it amounts to fraud and a fraud may be in the uh, following ways that is in suggestion as to a fact as to a fact um, of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true and the active concealment of fact by one having knowledge of or belief of the fact mere concealment is no uh, fraud but where steps are taken by the seller concealing some material facts so that the buyer even after a reasonable examination cannot trace the defects it will amount to fraud and a promise made without any intention of performing it is also a fraud and such any such act or omission um, as the law specifically declared to be fraud next um, Next is misrepresentation and the term misrepresentation means uh, a false representation of fact made by the party to a contract and made uh, innocently or non-disclosure of a material fact without any intention to uh, deceive the other party who has acted on the basis of such a representation. And uh, for example, X says to Y who intends to purchase his land and um, X says to Y that my land process produces uh, two tons of rice per acre. And X believes the statement to be true, although he has no sufficient ground for the belief. And X purchases, sorry, Y purchases X land and believing X statement. Later on, Y find that the land pr produces only 1.5 ton, tons of rice per acre. And here, um, here, um, the X representation um, is a misrepresentation. That is misrepresentation. And the next is uh, mistake. The word mistake is generally used in the law of the contract to refer an erroneous belief, which is uh, a belief that is not in accord uh, with the facts. And a mistake is said to uh, have occurred where the parties intending to do thing by error or do something else. Next, uh, the next is the discharge of a contract. A discharge of a contract means the termination of the contractual relationship between the parties of a contract. And a contract is said to be discharged when the rights and obligations of the parties under the contract come to an end. That is discharge of contract. Next, there is uh, some um, various modes of discharge of contract. And the first is the discharge by performance and the discharge by mutual agreement, discharge by operation of law, discharge by impossibility of performance, discharge by lapse of time as per the Limitation Act 1963 and discharge of breach of contract. Next, uh, discharge by performance and discharge by performance is uh, done through actual performance and attempted performance or tender. In case of actual performance, a contract is said to be discharged by actual performance when the parties to the contract um, perform their promises in accordance with the terms of the contract. An attempted performance or tender, a contract is said to be discharged by attempted performance when the promiser has made an offer of performance to the uh, promisee, but it has not been accepted by the promisee. And next. 
discharge by mutual agreement and discharge by mutual agreement is uh, happened on the uh, these ways that is novation rescission alteration remission waiver and the novation is substitution of a new contract for the original contract <coughs> A substitution is made of new contract for the original contract and a rescission is the cancellation of original contract by one party or the uh, one party or all the parties to a contract and um, there is an alteration change in terms of contract with the mutual consent here only change the terms of the contract parties are not changed and the remission acceptance by the promise promise of a lesser fulfillment of the promise made and a waiver intentional relinquishment of a right under the contract is waiver and these are the ways by mutual agreement is done next uh, discharge by uh, operation of law by a death of the promiser in case of a contract involving the personal skill or ability of the promiser some contract some uh, uh, business needs some personal skill or ability of ability of the parties involved in the contract and uh, by the death of a, uh, the promiser or uh, make the um, contract discharged and by insolvency when a person is declared insolvent he is discharged from the liability up to the date of his insolvency and by other unauthorized material alteration if any party makes any material alteration in the ter in the terms of the contract without the approval of the other party the contract comes to an end by the identity of uh, promiser and the promisee when the promiser become the pro uh, promiser become the uh, promisee the other uh, parties are discharged next and discharge by impossibility of performance effects of initial impossibility and effects of supervening impossibility and in the, in the effect of initial impossibility uh, means the impossibility existing at the time of making the contract uh, already they have to know the impossibility of uh, the execution of the contract and the effects of uh, supervening impossibility is uh, means impossibility which does not exist at the time of making the contract but which arises subsequently after the formation of the contract next and discharge by uh, lapse of time a contract is discharged if it is not performed uh, or enforced with a specified period called um, period of limitation and the limitation act 1963 has prescribed the uh, different periods for different contracts such as period of limitation for exercising the right um, to recover a debt of three years and to recover a movable uh, property is uh, 12 years and the contractual parties cannot exercise their rights after the expiry of period of limitation next and discharge by uh, breach of contract uh, a contract uh, is said to be discharged by breach of contract if if any party to the contract refuses or fails to perform his part uh, of the contract or by his act makes it impossible to perform his obligation under the contract it may occur in uh, actual breach or anticipatory breach next in the actual uh, breach it occurs when um, two in two ways on due date of performance and during the course of performance and if any party to a contract refuses or fails to perform his part of the contract at the time fixed uh, for performance it is called an actual uh, breach of contract on due date of performance uh, then uh, the next is the during the course of performance if any party has performed a part of the contract and then refuses or fails to perform the remaining part of the contract is called the uh, called an actual um, breach of contract during the course of performance and the next one is the anticipatory breach 
Anticipatory breach of contract occurs when the party declares his intention to uh, intention of not performing the contract before the performance is due. That is the anticipatory breach. And the next is consequences of breach of contract. And the aggrieved party, that is the party uh, not at fault, is um, discharged from his obligation and is entitled to proceed against the party at fault. Next. And uh, there are some remedies for breach of contract. And the first one is the suit for rescission. Rescission means the cancellation of the contract. On the rescission of the contract, the aggrieved party or injured party is discharged from all uh, obligations under the contract. And the court may grant a rescission where the contract is voidable at the option of the aggrieved party. And the party uh, rightfully resigns the contract. He also entitled to receive compensation for the damages sustained due to non-fulfillment of the contract. This is uh, the suit for rescission. And the next is um, a suit for next Lakshmi suit for damage. Damages are here. Damages are monetary compensation allowed for uh, loss suffered by the aggrieved party due to breach of contract. And the object of awarding damage is not to punish the party at fault, but to uh, make good uh, the financial loss suffered by the aggrieved party due to the breach of contract. And not all the cases, the court will uh, grant the damage uh, suit for uh, damage. Um, there are some, in the case of um, some special cases, the suit for damage will be um, allowed by the court. And the next is suit for specific performance. The term specific performance may be defined as the um, actual carrying out of the respective obligation of both the parties. And sometimes the damages are not an adequate remedy for breach of contract. In such cases, the court may direct the defaulting uh, party to carry out his obligation uh, according to the terms of the contract. And the specific performance will be allowed by the court where the subject matter is of special value or uh, consists of goods which are not easily available in the market. And the next is suit for injection. And the term injection may be defined as an order of the court restraining the as a person from doing something which he promised to uh, promised not to do. And it is usually issued in case where money compensation is not an adequate remedy for breach of contract. And injection is a mode of securing the performance of the negative terms in the contract. And the next suit for quantum near it. Quantum merit means as much as earned. It means a right to claim the compensation for the work already done. If the um, breach of contract is happened in the middle of a uh, middle of the performance of the um, subject ma matter of the contract, then uh, the aggrieved party can claim the um, consideration for the work already done. That is the suit for quantum merit. Next is a special contracts. And um, in the contract act, the special uh, contract uh, includes the contract of indemnity and contract of guarantee, etc. The contract of indemnity and contract of guarantee are specific type of contract. The specific provisions relating to these contracts are contained in section 124 to 147 of the Indian Contract Act 1872. And in addition to these specific provisions, the general principles of contracts are also applicable to such specific contracts. And next is uh, contract of uh, indemnity, which is defined under section 124 of the Contract Act 1872. And the term indemnity means to make uh, good the laws or to compensate the party who has suffered some loss. And the section 124 of the Indian Contract Act 1872 defines a contract of indemnity is a contract by which one party promises to save the other from loss caused to him by the conduct of the promiser himself or by the conduct of any other person. 
and the person who promises to protect or compensate is called the indemnifier and the person to whom the promise of indemnity is given is called the indemnity holder and next is the mode of uh, contract of indemnity and it is express and implied mode uh, when it is express mode when a person expressly promised to compensate the other from loss and the next is implied when it is to be inferred from the conduct of the parties or from the circumstances of the case uh, these are the mode of contract of indemnity and right rights of indemnity holder an indemnity holder is entitled to recover all damages cost and sum which me which he may uh, be compelled to pay from the indemnifier provided the acts within the scope of his authority and uh, there is a liability of the indemnifier and although the indian contract act 1872 is silent on the time of com uh, commencement of liability of the indemnifier but on the basis of some judicial uh, decisions of the court it can be said that the liability of the of an indemnifier commences as soon as the liability of the indemnity holder uh, becomes absolute and certain and um, essential elements uh, is in addition to the implied or express promise to indemnity all the essential elements of a valid contract must also be present in a um, contract of indemnity and the next is contract of guarantee which is defined under section 126 of the contract act and the term guarantee means an undertaking by one person uh, to pay the amount due from another person when the latter fails to pay and the section 126 of the indian contract act a contract of guarantee is a contract to perform the promise or to discharge the liability of a third person in case of his default for example x and uh, his friend y enter a shop and x says to z uh, supply the goods required by y and if he uh, does not pay you i will i will pay it and it is a contract of guarantee and a contract of guarantee needs a uh, three parties that is the principal debtor creditor and surety and the principal debtor is the party uh, on whose behalf or for whom the guarantee is given in uh, in the first example here y is the principal debtor and the creditor is the part uh, is the person um, the party to whom the guarantee is given in the case of this example z is the uh, creditor and coming to the surety the party who gives the guarantee is the surety and the aforesaid example x is the surety and liability of a surety is equal to that of the principal debtor unless otherwise agreed this is a contract of guarantee and next essential features of a contract of guarantee and it a tripartite agreement uh, agreement between the principal creditor and surety it is essential very essential Uh, it includes three parties and consent of three parties there must be consent of all the three parties required for uh, a contract of guarantee and existence of liability and essentials of a valid contract uh, essentials of a valid contract is uh, also needed for the contract of guarantee and guarantee not to be obtained by misrepresentation and guarantee not to be obtained by concealment and the next is contract of uh, bailment and pledge the term bailment is derived from the french word bailer which means to deliver and legally it means change of possession of goods from one person to another for some specific uh, purposes and the term pledge means the delivery of uh, goods as security for a uh, loan or fulfillment of an obligation and both of the contracts are special type of contracts these are contained in section 148 to 181 of the indian contract act and the next uh, according to section 148 a bailment is the delivery of goods by one person to another for some purpose upon a contract that they shall when the 
purpose is accomplished be returned or otherwise uh, disposed of according to the directions of the person delivering them and uh, for example why hires a horse from x4 riding and x delivers a horse to a doctor um, y for uh, medical treatment here um, x delivers his horse to uh, doctor y for medical treatment and after the treatment he will return the horse and this is bailment and then next is lakshmi essential elements of a bailment an agreement there must uh, there must be an agreement between the bailer and bailee this may be uh, either express or implied and the uh, the another one is delivery of goods it is um, there must be delivery of goods it means that the possession of uh, possession must be transferred and purpose the delivery of goods must be for some intended purpose and the return of specific goods and after the accomplishment of the purpose or after the expiry of the period of the bailment the goods which form the subject matter of bailment must be returned and uh, returned to the bailer or otherwise disposed of according to the directions of the bailer and these are the essential elements of a bailment and next is uh, pledge uh, the bailment of goods as security for payment for of a debt or performance of promise is called a pledge or bond an example Uh, X borrows rupees one lakh from City Bank and keeps his shares as security for payment of a debt. It is a contract of pledge, and uh, the parties included in a pledge is owner or pledger, the person who delay delivers the goods as security for payment of debt or performance of a promise is called the owner or pledger. And in the example uh, here, X is the a pledger and the pony or the pledge the person to whom the goods are delivered as security for payment of a debt or performance of a promise is called the pony or the pledge in this example city bank is the uh, pledge and the next is special features of pledge Uh, it is the special property in goods and not the general property in goods which is transferred to the pledge and general property means the ownership of goods and special property means the possession of goods this is the special feature of pledge and next is a contract of agency this is also a special type of contract the contract of agency is contained in chapter 10 uh, section 182 1238 of the indian contract act 82 and the contract of agency a person employs another person to do any act for him or to represent him in dealing with the third persons so as to bind himself uh, by the act of such another person and um, test of agency means the true test of agency lies in answering the then whether a person has the capacity to create contractual relationship between the principal and the third party and to bind the principal by his acts and if the answer uh, if the answer to this question is yes there exists the relationship of agency otherwise not and um, agent is um, agent is a person uh, employed to do any act for another or to represent another dealing with the third person uh, this an agent establishes a contract between such another person and the third person uh, who may be an agent um, any person uh, may become an agent the same minor or a person of unsound mind can also become an agent though an agent uh, who is not of the age of maturity and who is not of sound mind uh, is a um, is not responsible to this principle anybody can be an agent but the responsibility is uh, up to the um, soundness of the person of uh, person is entitled to be the agent and the next is uh, 
next act is the uh, sale of goods act and um, in the previous um, act that is the indian contract act 1872 there are uh, most of the questions were asked from that part and um, the next is the sale of goods act 1930 till 1930 transactions relating to sale and purchase of goods were regulated by the indian contract act 1872 and in 1930 uh, the section 76 to 123 of the indian contract act 1872 were uh, repealed and the and a separate act called the indian sale of goods act 1930 was passed and it uh, came into force on 1st july 1930 with the effect from 22nd september uh, 1963 the word indian uh, was removed and presently it is called as the sale of uh, goods act 1930 and this act extend to the whole of india except the state of jammu and kashmir and according to section 3 the provisions of the indian contract act 1872 still continue to apply to contract of the sale of goods except where the sale of goods act 1930 provides for the contrary and the next is uh, the scope of a sale of goods act the sale of goods act deals with the sale but not with the mortgage and uh, but not with mortgage or pledge this act deals with the goods but not with the other movable property for example auctionable uh, claim and uh, money in some uh, other words this act does not deal with the movable property other than goods and uh, immovable property and the next is um, next is a uh, contract of sale according to section 41 of the sale of goods act 1930 the contract of sale is a contract whereby the seller transfer of or agrees to transfer the property of goods to the buyer for a price and the contract of sale is a generic term which includes both the sale as well as an agreement to sell and the next is um under the sale of goods act goods means uh, there are certain things which are not included in goods and some uh, what are the goods which are included in goods and first one is which includes growing crops standing timber grass and old currency water gas electricity trademark patent copyright shares stock or debentures these all are included as part of goods and um, the exclusion it is immovable property money or currency auctionable claim or uh, here uh, old currency is not uh, old currency is included in the uh, goods and money is not included and the next is next let's sale of goods act 1930 classifies goods as existing goods future goods contingent goods and existing goods uh, uh, include specific goods uncertain unascertained goods and ascertained goods and future goods it is uh, included to be uh, future goods are goods to be produced uh, or manufactured in future and contingent goods may be may or may not be delivered and here uh, specific goods are uh, goods which are identified and uh, agreed upon at the time when a contract of sale is made and un unascertained goods are not identified and agreed upon at the time when a contract of sale is made and um, ascertained goods are which are identified and set aside for a given contract out of a mass of unascertained goods and this uh, will be explained with an example next lakshmi um here is an example for uh, the type of good and go to a maruti car showroom there 10 maruti cars have been displayed and x agrees to buy one maruti car 800 and the seller agrees to sell 
here 10 cars will be classified as 10 cars are unascertained goods before the identification of particular car to be sold there is no identification of a particular car so those 10 cars are unascertained goods and the uh, nine cars are unascertained goods after the identification of one particular car to be sold and such one particular car to be sold is an ascertained goods then part of the goods lying in bulk are identified and earmarked for sale such goods are termed as unascertained as goods are termed as ascertained goods and uh, here one particular car identified and agreed upon at the time when the contract of sale is made is specific goods and the other nine cars are unascertained goods and the next is contract of sale includes uh, both sale and agreement to sell here uh, sale is where the ownership in goods is transferred uh, then uh, the sale is happened and the agreement to agreement to sell is that where the transfer of ownership in goods is to take place at a future time or subject to fulfillment of some conditions an agreement to sell becomes a sale when the uh, time elapses or the conditions are fulfilled subject to which of which the following which the ownership in the goods is to be transferred and the next is Uh, here are some uh, difference uh, between sale and agreement to sell. In case of transfer of ownership, transfer of ownership uh, is taken place um, in the case of uh, sale. It is taken place immediately in the case of sale. When it comes to agreement to sell, transfer of ownership of goods is uh, to taken place at the future time or subject to fulfillment of some conditions. And uh, Next is uh, next point is executed uh, contract. Executed contract or executory contract. It is an executed contract because uh, nothing remains to be done. Uh, in case of agreement to sell, it is an extraordinary contract, executory contract because something remains to be done. And uh, conveyance of property, buyer gets a right to enjoy the goods against the whole world including uh, sell, seller therefore a sale creates just in drum uh, it is right against property and in the case of agreement to sell buyer does not get uh, such a right to enjoy the goods it only creates just in personam which means a right against the person here the sale of uh, in case of sale it is uh, just in drum which means the right against a property or thing in case of agreement uh, agreement to sell it is uh, it is about the right against the person and the next is um, next point is next slide transfer of uh, risk the transfer of risk of loss of uh, goods take place immediately because ownership is transferred as a, um, as a result uh, sale is happen and the transfer of uh, transfer of risk of loss of goods does not take place uh, because ownership is not transferred as a result in case of destruction of goods the loss shall be borne by the seller even though the goods are in the possession of the buyer and the um, seller can sue the buyer for the price even though the goods are in his possession and in the case of agreement to seller, seller can sue the buyer for damages even though the goods are in the possession of the buyer. And uh, the rights of the buyer against the sellers, seller's breaches, buyer can sue the seller for damages and uh, can sue the third party who bought those goods for goods. And buyer can sue the seller for damages only. And the next slide is. Uh, effects of insolvency of seller having possession of goods in the case of sale buyer can claim the goods from the official uh, receiver or assignee uh, because the owner of the goods has transferred to the buyer and in the case of agreement to sell buyer cannot claim the goods even when he has paid the price because the ownership has not uh, transferred to the buyer and the buyer 
who has paid the price can only claim uh, rateable dividend. And uh, basis of distinction is on effects of insolvency of the buyer before paying the price. Uh, in case of sale, uh, seller must deliver the goods to the official uh, receiver or assignee because of the ownership uh, of goods has transferred to the buyer. He can only claim a uh, rateable dividend for an unpaid price. And the case of uh, agreement to sell, a seller can refuse to deliver the goods unless he is paid full price of the goods because of the uh, because the ownership has not transferred uh, to the buyer. Next is uh, next is the caveat um, um, tender, which means the uh, means that let the buyer beware or. Uh, no seller's uh, duty. A seller need not disclose the defects of his goods. It's a buyer's duty to satisfy himself about the quality as well as the uh, suitability of the good. And uh, uh, in case, uh, it means that the let the buyer beware, which means that, and this doctrine of Kavi Tempter has uh, been given in the um, given us subject to the provisions of this act and any other law for the time being in force there is no implied warranty or condition as to the quality or fitness for any particular purpose uh, of goods supplied under a contract of sale here uh, it is not part of the seller's duty to point out uh, the defects of the goods uh, which he offers to sale offers for sale rather it is the duty of the buyer uh, to satisfy himself uh, with the quality as well as the suitability of, of the goods uh, goods and which is um, the rule of caveat tender does not apply where the buyer has disclosed the purpose for which the goods are required and relied upon the seller's skills skills or judgment and um, there are some exceptions in case of representation by the seller, in case of concealment of uh, latent defect, in case of sale by description, in case of sale by sample, sale by sample as well as description, fitness for a particular purpose, and mercantile quality. In these all cases, it is not applicable. And uh, it is uh, the relevant of this um, use uh, relevant of this um, caveat tempter is the um, appeared to play an important role in the past uh, when a trade was conducted on a local scale or by the buyer had every opportunity to examine its features of features of the goods but however in the in this now the present context it is uh, the rigorous of the rules have been mitigated because of global dimensions of trade and uh, the government legislations on consumer protection and uh, professional management of various intention, intense competition and consumer awarenesses, uh, the, this rule, caveat tender, should be uh, replaced by the uh, rule of caveat vendor, which means let the buyer, let the seller beware. Uh, uh, it is um, caveat tender. And the next is, uh, right of seller and uh, right of buyer. Here, um, the unpaid seller have some um, right uh, for suit. First one is the suit for price, a suit for interest, and a suit for damages for non-acceptance of goods, suit for damages for uh, repudiation of the contract. These are the rights of the uh, unpaid seller and the rights of the um, buyer against the seller is suit for damages for non-delivery of goods, suit for specific performance, suit for breach of warranty, suit for interest, if any advances have been given, and right to treat the contract as a rescinded or operative in case of uh, repudiation of the contract by seller before due date. And the next is, uh, next uh, regulation is the uh, Negotiable Instrument Act 1881 and the 
A Negotiable Instrument Act 1881 came into force on 1st March 1881. It extends to the whole of India except to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, the act deals with the law relating to three uh, specific uh, classes of negotiable instruments like promissory note, bill of exchange and check. And the act does not apply to Indian Paper Currency Act 1871, uh, the local uh, usage relating to any instrument in an oriental language uh, uh, like Hundis. And But where no custom is established, the act will apply to Hundis. And the next is... Um, Negotiable Instrument Act 1881. Um, here there are uh, two terms that is negotiable and instrument. Negotiable means transferable. It is transferable between two people and instrument means in, it's a written document. Any agreed upon medium of exchange usually refers to check, draft, bill of exchange, promissory note, etc. And uh, uh, when it comes to the definition, it means a promissory note, a bill of exchange, or a check payable either to uh, order or to the bearer. And the next is the negotiable instruments. Um, uh, in what are what is included in negotiable negotiable instruments and what is what are in, excluded in the negotiable instrument. In the inclusion, uh, it is included a promissory note, bill of exchange, and check. And it excludes uh, treasury bills, currency notes, post office money orders. Hundi, uh, Hundis in case uh, it is conditions applied for uh, in the case of Hundis. And the next is uh, negotiable instruments. According to Wills, a negotiable instrument is uh, one the property in which is required, which is acquired by anyone who takes it bona fide and for value in spite of any defect of the title in the person from whom he took it. Hence, uh, a negotiable instrument must possess uh, two features like the right of ownership contained in the instrument can be transferred from one person to another by mere delivery if it is payable to bearer or by endorsement and delivery if payable to order and the transferee taking the instrument in good faith and for consideration gets a good title to the same even though the title of the transferer is defective. This is a negotiable instrument and the next is uh, the characteristics of negotiable instrument. Uh, these are the essential characteristics. Uh, it must have payable uh, to order or bearer. It must be payable either to order or to bearer. And uh, uh, freely transferable. A negotiable instrument must be freely transferable uh, to an instrument payable to order is negotiable by endorsement and delivery and an instrument payable to bearer is negotiable by mere delivery. And presumption as to holder. Every holder of a negotiable instrument is presumed to be a holder is due course. In due course and title of holder in due course free from all defects and a holder is to in due course uh, that is the person who became the processor possessor of negotiable instrument before maturity for valuable consideration and in good faith gets the instrument free from all defects in the title of the uh, transferer and presumption as a consideration and every negotiable instrument is presumed to have been made drawn accepted endorsed negotiated or transferred for consideration and the next is uh, types of uh, negotiable in instruments there are um, different types of negotiable instruments a uh, bearer instrument order instrument inland instrument and uh, uh, so on from among these uh, the important negotiable instruments are uh, like Lakshmi next slide important one is uh, the uh, promissory note bill of exchange and check and it, promissory notes according to section 4 of the instrument negotiable instrument act 1881 uh, a promissory note is an instrument in writing a note being a bank note or currency note and containing an unconditional undertaking signed by the maker to pay a certain sum of money only to or to the order of a certain person or to the bearer of the instrument and a promissory note may be payable on demand 
or after a definite period of time. And the words or to the bearer of the instrument have become inoperative in view of the uh, provisions contained in section 31.2 of the uh, Reserve Bank of India Act which provides that no person in India or other than Reserve Bank of India or the central government can make a or issue promissory note payable to bearer to the instrument. And a bank note or currency note is not promissory note because it is money itself. Next. And essential uh, characteristics of a promissory note are it must be in writing and express promise to pay a definite uh, and an unconditional promise and it is signed by the maker and um, it, uh, it uh, promised to pay certain sum and promised to pay money only and certain payee duly stamped. These are the essential characteristics of a promissory note and uh, there are two parties involved in a promissory note and the maker and the payee. The maker is the person who make the uh, promissory note and the payee is the person to whom or to whose order the uh, payment is to be made. It is called the payee. And the next is, uh, next is bill of exchange. It is defined under section 5 of the Negotiable Instrument Act 1881. A bill of exchange is an instrument in writing containing an unconditional order signed by the maker directing a certain person to pay a certain sum of money only to or to uh, the order of a certain person or the bearer of the instrument and thus a bill is an order by the by a creditor upon his debtor requiring uh, him to pay the money uh, to the person specified and the next is uh, these are the essential characteristics of a bill of exchange and it must be in writing express uh, order to pay there must be an express order to pay and not a mere request to pay and um, it is definite and unconditional order the order must be definite and unconditional and order to pay certain sum the order um, specify uh, the order must pay to pay some certain sum and uh, order to pay money only the order must be pay in, in uh, money or money only and certain uh, three parties the in a bill of exchange there must have three parties that is the drawer drawee and the pay and signed by the drawer it must be signed by the drawer and it also duly stamped and the next is uh, parties involved in a bill of exchange uh, there are uh, three parties in a bill of exchange that is the drawer the drawee and the pay. The person uh, who draws a bill of exchange is called the drawer and the person who the uh, whom the bill of exchange is drawn is called the drawee and he is also called an acceptor of the bill and the payee the person to whom or to whose uh, order the money is directed to be paid by uh, by the instrument is called the pay. Um, for example, an A sells goods to B for rupees 10,000 to be paid three months after um, after date and buys goods from C for rupees 10,000 on similar terms. And if A directs to B to pay the sum of rupees 10,000 to C, uh, this uh, order will be a bill of exchange. And here A is the drawer, B is the drawee and C is the Pay. And the next is, uh, the next one is uh, under negotiable instrument is check. And a check is a bill of exchange which is uh, drawn upon a specified banker payable on demand and include uh, the electronic image of the truncated check, um, a check in electronic form. And a truncated check means the uh, digitalized image of the um, paper check. And the next is essential characteristics of a check. And the next is, um, it is in writing, it must be in writing. An express order to pay, there must be an express order to pay and not a mere request. Like uh, the previous one, 
and definite and unconditional order the order must be definite and unconditional and signed by the drawer and order to pay certain sum uh, a certain uh, three parties involved in that is the drawer drawee and payee and in addition to the FOS essential also of bill of exchange uh, the check must also satisfy the um, uh, two more requirements that is drawn upon a specified bank and payable on demand and the next is Uh, uh, negotiation and assignment. Um, an instrument is said to be negotiated when a negotiable instrument is uh, transferred to any person so as to constitute that person the holder of the instrument. And the essence of a negotiation is that it must be uh, made with the intention of transferring a title of the instrument to the transferring which is the essence of uh, a, um, negotiation. And for example, X was the holder of a check of rupees 10,000 payable to bearer. And he delivered this check to Y uh, to keep it in his safe custody. Here, uh, there is no negotiation of check from X to Y because the transfer of the check to Y makes him a bailey only and not the holder of the check. This is uh, negotiation. And next is uh, how to effect a negotiation. There are two methods of transfer by negotiation. That is negotiation by delivery. Uh, the first one is negotiation by delivery. And it uh, here, um, a bearer instrument is negotiable by voluntary delivery thereof or thus the instrument uh, must be actually delivered and the delivery must also be voluntary. For example, X was the holder of a check for rupees 10,000 payable to bearer. He kept the check in his safe uh, and Y, a thief, stolen the check from X safe. Here, uh, there is no negotiation of the check from X to Y because the check was not voluntarily delivered to Y. And it may also be noted that if Y delivers this check for someone, some uh, consideration to uh, some other person like uh, Z, uh, who receives the same in good faith and before maturity. And Z will become the holder in due course and will, en will be entitled to receive the amount of the instrument and uh, the next is um, the effect of negotiation is the next slide is um, the negotiation effect is uh, through negotiation by endorsement and delivery and order instrument in is negotiable by endorsement and delivery thereof thus a mere endorsement that is the signing of negotiable instrument for the purpose of negotiation does not amount to negotiation unless there is delivery of the same. The delivery uh, uh, is uh, very essential. And the next is duration of a negotiability which is uh, defined under section 60 uh, is an negotiable instrument may be negotiated by a person other than the maker, drawer or acceptor until payment. And uh, by the maker, drawee, or acceptor until maturity. This is the duration of negotiability. And the next is uh, a meaning of uh, assignment. An instrument said to be assigned when a negotiable instrument is transferred by means of a written and a registered document under the provisions of the Transfer of Property Act 1882. The person who transfer his right to recover the payment of a debt is called the assigner and the person to whom such a right are transferred is called an assignee. Here, the assignee takes the instrument subject to all equities which uh, um, arise between uh, the party liable and the assigner. Thus, the assignee gets the rights of the assigner only. He does not get the rights of a holder in due course. And the next is uh, this is the basis of a difference between negotiation and assignment. Uh, 
consideration in the case of consideration under negotiation it is presumed while in the case of assignment it is proved and uh, bearer instrument are negotiated by mere delivery and uh, instrument order uh, are negotiated by endorsement and delivery and in case of assignment assignment is done always by means of a written and a registered document under the provisions of transfer of property act and uh, um, negotiation can be done in respect of negotiable instruments only assignment can be done in, done in case of other uh, documents also and uh, um, a notice of the transfer uh, to the debtor by the transfer is not necessary and uh, assignment does not bind the debtor unless notice of assignment has been given by the assignee to the debtor and the debtor is in turn expressly or in, uh, impliedly has assented in the case of um, a title of the uh, document a transferee acquires a title uh, better than that of the transferor and in the case of assignment the assigner does not acquire a title better than that of the assigner assignee because the title of the assignee is subject to all equities in the title of assigner in other words assignee gets the rights of assigner only and in the case of negotiation stamp duty uh, negotiation uh, does not require any stamp duty but assignment requires stamp duty and the next is uh, a dishonor of a bill and uh, there are some modes of dishonor the bill of exchange um, uh, excludes check may be dishonored by non-acceptance or non-payment it is to be noted that a promissory note or check can be dishonored by non-payment only because a promissory note or check uh, does not require any acceptance and the next is Uh, dishonor by non-acceptance is a bill of exchange is said to be dishonored by non-acceptance in any of the uh, circumstances if the drawee does not accept it within 48 hours from the time of presentment if all the drawees who are not partners in the case uh, there are more than one drawee do not accept and while the drawee is incompetent to contract when the drawee is uh, a fictitious person and when the drawee gives a qualified acceptance and the holder does not give uh, his consent to qualified acceptance and when the drawee cannot be found after reasonable search and when the presentment for acceptance is ex excused and the bill is not accepted and the next is uh, an instrument be dishonored by non-payment in any one of the following circumstances when the party primarily liable uh, to make default in payment upon being duly required to pay the same and when the presentment for uh, payment is excused and the instrument when overdue remains unpaid and the next is discharge of an agreement a discharge of an instrument uh, is said to be uh, an inst instrument is said to be discharged only when the party who is um, ultimately liable thereon is discharged from liability and all rights of action under the instrument are completely extinguished and the instrument ceases to be negotiable and the next is uh, the mode of discharge of uh, instrument and by uh, payment in due course if the maker or acceptor makes payment to the holder of the instrument at or after maturity in good faith and without notice of any defect in the title of the instrument and uh, by cancellation if the holder of an instrument cancels acceptors or endorses name with the uh, intent to discharge him and by release if the holder um, of an instrument renounce his right against the against all the parties to the instrument and uh, by parity primarily liable becoming holder if the acceptor of the of a bill of exchange becomes its holder 
at or after maturity in his own right this is the mode of uh, discharge of an instrument and the next is uh, the next act is uh, limited liability partnership uh, it is limited liability partnership act 2008 and it's a form of uh, it's a hybrid form of um, uh, private limited company and uh, partnership firms an indian government passed the llp act on january 9 2009 and llp act 2008 gets notified with effect from 31st march 2009 and the first llp was registered on 2nd april 2009 and uh, what are, what is the need for llp to enable the professionals to deal in international activities on the concept of limited liability which was earlier not possible uh, due to various uh, restrictions and to remove the restrictions posed to uh, the professionals not allowed to have more than 10 or 20 partners llp act removed the above uh, such obstacles and the next is uh, certain features of uh, limited liability partnership and um, the uh, it is a form of uh, limited liability of partners and it is flexible form of organization and administration according to uh, llp agreement the administration procedures all are based on the llp agreement and uh, required to register with the uh, registrar of companies an LLP agreement is the main incorporation document and the economic rights of partners are freely transferable and it has perpetual succession and a separate legal entity and every partner is an agent of the LLP but not liable for the wrongful acts of other uh, partners and in the absence of any provisions for distribution of profits losses partners are entitled to share profits and losses equally and LLPs are not allowed to operate as a not-for-profit organization. It is only for the purpose of earning profit. And the next is, uh, it is governed by the Limited Liability Partnership Act 2008 and uh, Limited Liability Partnership Rules 2008 and by registrar of companies and the LLP agreement with the partners. These are the governing bodies. And the next is, uh, uh, some definition regarding partner and a designated partner. Uh, section 5 defines the partner. Any individual or body corporate may be uh, a partner in a limited liability partnership. And uh, there are some designated partners, which is defined under Section 7, uh, which means any part partner designated as such under section 7 and uh, subject to section 7 1 of the incorporation document specifies who are we who are to be designated partners such persons shall be designated partners on incorporation and say that each of the partners from the from time to time of llp is to be uh, designated partners and every partner shall be a designated partner and designated partner need to uh, dpin that is um partners um designated partners identification number from the central government and any partner may become or cease to be a designated partner partner in accordance with the llp agreement and every llp must have at least two partners and um and the next is um incorporation of llp and it uh, required uh, partners minimum two designated partners are required and no limit on maximum uh, and the capital there is no limit on minimum and the maximum capital contribution and name of the llp uh, is at least two proposed names are required and the objects as per the llp agreement and the documents needed for uh, the llp um, uh, incorporation procedure are id proof address proof for and photos of the partners and the, the designated partners llp agreement duly stamped as per the relevant stamp act of the state 
and uh, subscriber statements and a consent letter from all partners and the designated partners as per form number nine and a proof of address of registered office. And the next is uh, incorporation document. Um, it include at least two subscribers, two or more persons associated to for carrying on uh, a lawful business with a view to profit must subscribe their names to the incorporation document. And the next is the incorporation uh, document shall consist of uh, we in a form, form as may be prescribed and the, it states the name of the limited liability partnership and uh, state uh, the proposed business of the LLP and state the address of the registered office of the LLP and it states the name and address of each of the persons who are to be partners of the LLP of own incorporation and state the name and address of the persons who are to be designated partners of the LLP on incorporation and contain such other information concerning the proposed LLP as may be prescribed. And the next slide is uh, incorporation documents. The third one is filing. The incorporation document must be filed along with the compliance statement in such a manner that uh, with the, such a fees as may be prescribed with the registrar of, of the state in which the registered office of the LLP is to be situated. And the compliance statement is a statement in the prescribed form made by either an advocate or a company secretary or a chartered accountant or a cost accountant who is engaged in the information of the LLP and by anyone who subscribed his name to the incorporation document that all the requirements of this act uh, and the rules made there under have been complied with the, in respect of incorporation and matters precedent uh, and incidental thereto. And the last one is penalty. If a person makes a statement which uh, he knows to be false or uh, does not believe to be true, shall be punishable with the imprisonment of a term of rupees, uh, with a term of two years and with a fine which shall not be less than rupees 10,000 but which may extend to 2 rupees 5 lakhs. And the next is uh, the formation procedure of LLP in India. Uh, uh, first, first step is to obtain a digital signature certificate of the partners and the designated partners. And to next is to obtain the director identification number for the partners. And the third step is to obtain the name approval. After that, uh, to file for incorporation. These are the steps for uh, the procedure of LLP in India and the incorporation uh, by registration um, on compliance of all the requir requirements as per the section 11, the registrar shall register the incorporation document and uh, give a certificate that the LLP is incorporated by the name specified therein within 14 days. And uh, uh, the certificate is issued shall be signed by the registrar and the certificate is issued shall authenticated by the official seal of the registrar and the, the certificate shall be the conclusive evidence of the LLP is incorpor incorporated by the name specified therein. And the next is uh, the effect of registration. The next is uh, on uh, the registration after the completion of the registration LLP shall by its name be capable of suing and be being sued, acquiring, owing, uh, holding and developing or disposing of property, whether movable, immobile or tangible or intangible, and having a common seal if it decides uh, to have one, and doing and suffering such other acts and things as body corporates may lawfully do and suffer. Uh, this is the effects of registration. And the next is Uh, regarding the difference between a partnership and a LLP. Uh, uh, the partnership are governed by the Indian Partnership Act and the LLP Act uh, is uh, the governing body of the LLP and registration uh, is optional for partnership but in case of uh, LLP it is uh, compulsory and uh, the partnership is created by agreement and uh, the LLP is created by law and um, partnership has uh, no separate uh, legal entity but in case of LLP it has separate legal entity 
and uh, name of the entity uh, uh, it can have any names as per choice but the llp's name contain limited liability partnership or llp as the suffix and the next is next slide um, uh, it has a perpetual succession uh, but in case of partnership it does not have perpetual succession because the death or insolvency or unsoundness of its members may affect its existence uh, and uh, but in case of llp it has a perpetual succession the death or insolvency or unsoundness of its members does not affect its existence members may come and go but the llp goes forever and the uh, uh, charter document for the partnership is the partnership deed and uh, of the firm which denotes its scope operation and the rights and the duties of the partners and in case of llp it is the um, uh, llp agreement is the charter uh, document uh, which uh, denotes its scope operation and uh, uh, rights and duties of the partners and um, there is no concept of a common seal in partnership and llp may have be, have its own uh, common seal as per its uh, agreement next is um, uh, the next is the incorporation formalities under the partnership it did need a partnership deed form or affidavit prescribe the fees required to uh, to be filled with the registrar of firms under uh, llp llp agreement various e forms prescribe the fees um, are required to be filled with the, um, the registrar uh, of llp and um, compared to uh, the incorporation time taken for incorporation and it takes uh, seven days appro approximately uh, for uh, to incorporate for the case of partnership but in case of llp it takes 10 days approximately with the um, uh, inclusive of the time taken to obtain the dpin that is the um, uh, directors um, sorry designate partners identification number including the uh, the number uh, it takes 10 days approximately and uh, a partnership only registered uh, only registered partners can be uh, can sue the third party a llp being a legal entity can sue third party or uh, can um, prosecute uh, third party and uh, can a uh, foreign national become a partner in case of partnership there is uh, there cannot be uh, cannot uh, become a partner in um, a foreigner in a partnership in india but in case of an LLP, foreign national can also become a partner in an LLP. And this is the major uh, comparison between LLP and partnership. And from this part, uh, a previous question was asked in the previous, in the 2020 exam. And uh, next is, uh, some more uh, points regarding its uh, comparison, that is uh, the number of members um, uh, there are minimum uh, two and maximum 10 for banking business and 20 for non-banking business in case of partnership but in case of llp there must be minimum two but there is no limit on maximum number of partners and uh, ownership of assets uh, uh, partners have a joint ownership of all the assets belonging to the partnership firm but LLP is being a legal entity independent of the partners has ownership of asset and um, the rights, duties, obligation of the partners are governed by partnership deed. But in case of uh, LLP, it is governed by uh, the LLP agreement and the liability of a partner is unlimited. But uh, partners are separately and jointly liable for actions of other partners and the firm and um, uh, liability extends to the personal to their personal assets and the liability of the partner is limited uh, under the llp uh, to the extent their contribution towards llp and except in case of internal intentional fraud or wrongful act of omission or commission by the partner um, and the next is um, a mutual agency partners are agents of the firm and other partners and partners are uh, under uh, llp partners act as agents of the llp and not of the uh, not the agent of the other partners 
and um, partnership under far, partnership it, it need not have a, a designated partners but it is a must for um, designated partners for llp uh, and um, there is there is at least two individuals as designated partners under llp and of whom at least one must be a resident in india and uh, the resident means uh, he uh, has been in india uh, 182 days uh, in the previous year and each dp each designated partner is required to have a dpin before appointment and um, in case of uh, partnership there is not required for a digital signature but llp at least one dp what designated partner must have a, a digital signature since e forms are filed electronically and the dissolution of uh, partnership uh, may take place uh, by mutual agreement by insolvency and by certain contingencies and by a court of order and the dissolution under llp uh, can be taken place uh, by voluntarily or by order of national company law tribunal and the next is uh, winding up of llp and winding up of llp is defined as the process by which the life of a llp is brought to an end and it promptly prop its property administered for the benefit of its members and creditors and an administrator called the liquidator is appointed and he takes control of the llp and collects its assets pays debts and finally distributes any surpluses among the members in accordance with their rights and uh, at the end of winding up the llp will have no assets or liabilities and winding up is a process where all the assets of the business are disposed of to meet the liabilities of the same and surplus if any is distributed among the members and the next is uh two modes for winding up of llp the first is voluntary winding up and the compulsory winding up and uh, the next is um voluntary winding up next slide next um, and voluntary winding up take place uh, under uh, under voluntary winding up the partners may between themselves decide to stop and winding up the operations of the llp and any llp may be wound up voluntarily if the llp passes a resolution to wind up the llp with the approval of at least 3/4 of the total number of its partners and but if the llp has creditors whether secured or unsecured the approval of such creditors are also be required for its winding up and a copy of the resolution shall be filed with the registrar within 30 days of passing such resolution and the voluntary winding up shall be deemed to commence on the date of the resolution for voluntary winding up and the declaration of solvency is very important in case of proposal to wind up voluntarily and it should be made by a majority of its designated partners uh, being not less than 2 and verified by an affidavit to the effect of the uh, effect that the llp has no debt or that it will be able to pay its uh, debt in full within such period and as may be specified in the declaration and but not exceeding one year from the commencement of winding up and the next is this is in the case of voluntary winding up and the next is compulsory winding up or winding up by the tribunal and the tribunal may wound up uh, the llp in the following circumstances and if the llp decides that the llp be wound up by the tribunal Uh, if uh, for a period of uh, more than 6 months the number of partners of the llp is reduced below 2 that circumstance the uh, compulsory winding have been taken place and if the llp is unable to pay its debts llp can't pay its debts and if the llp has acted against the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of india the security of the state or uh, public order and if the llp um, llp has acted again, uh, sorry if the llp has made a default in filing with the registrar the statement of account and solvency or annual return for any five consecutive financial years 
and if the tribunal is of the opinion that it is just and equitable that the llp be bound up these are the uh, circumstances while compensatory winding up of uh, llp is taken place and the next is uh, the next act is the information technology act the information technology act was enacted by the indian parliament in 2000 it is the primary primary law in government for matters related to cyber crime uh, and e-commerce uh, the act was enacted to give legal uh, sanction to electronic commerce and electronic transaction to enable e-governance and also uh, to prevent cyber crimes under this law uh, for uh, any crime involving computer or a network located in india foreign nationals can also be charged and the law prescribes penalties for various cyber crimes and fraud through digital electronic format and it's also legal recognition to digital uh, signature the it act also amended certain provisions of the indian penal code bangers book evidence act 1891 and the indian evidence act 1872 and the reserve bank of india act 1934 uh, to <coughs> modify these laws to make them uh, compliant with the new digital technologies and in the wake of the recent um, uh, Indochina border crash, the government of India banned various Chinese apps under the Information Technology Act like TikTok and other Chinese app, uh, app were banned. And the next is uh, the objectives of the IT Act 2000. And uh, it grant uh, to provide, uh, to grant uh, legal recognition uh, for transactions carried out by means of electronic data interchange or electronic commerce in place of paper-based method of communication and give legal recognition to electronic signature for authentication of any information or matter which requires authentication under any law and facilitate the electronic filing of documents uh, with the government departments and facilitate the electronic storage of data and provide a legal sanction to transfer fund electronically to BT, uh, to and between banks and financial institutions. And it provide a legal recognition for keeping books of accounts in electronic format by bankers and to amend various acts related to this uh, um, IT and provide legal infrastructure to promote e-commerce and secure information system and manage crimes at national and international level by enforcing laws uh, this is the main objectives these are the main objectives of it act 2000 and uh, next is uh, cyber crimes uh, it is um, crimes based on um, different uh, groups that is it is categorized into three uh, groups that is crimes against individuals uh, it is um, it is individuals organization and uh, the society and these individuals, uh, it is uh, email harassment, cyber stalking, spreading obscene materials, and uh, spoofing via email, fraud, and also cheating. And the next is, next slide is uh, the crime against organization, like processing unauthorized information, cyber terrorism against the government organization, distributing pirated softwares, and uh, crime against the society, like polluting the youth through indecent exposure, trafficking, financial crimes, selling illegal articles, online gambling, forgery, etc. Apart from these um, crimes uh, like hacking, denial of service, attack and email bombing, etc. are also present in cyberspace. And the next slide is uh, laws against cyber crime in India. And um, it is uh, it is ever since that the uh, Introduction of cyber laws in India, the Information Technology Act 2000 covers different uh, types of crimes under cyber law. And uh, these are identity theft. Identity theft is denied, defined as the theft of personal information of an individual to avail financial services or steal the financial assets themselves. And cyber terrorism is committed with the purpose of causing serious harm or exertion of any kind subjected to as a person, group of individuals or government. And uh, the next is cyberbullying is the act of intimidating 
harassment, defaming, or any other form of mental uh, degradation through the use of electronic means mode such, uh, or uh, modes such as social media, and hacking. Access to information through fraudulent or unethical means is known as hacking. This is the most common form of cyber crime uh, known uh, to the general public. And the next slide, please. Uh, uh, the next is defamation. While every individual has his or her right to speech on internet platform as well as as well, but if uh, their statement uh, cross a line and harm the reputation of any individuals or organizations, then they can uh, be charged with the defamation law. And the next is uh, trade secrets. And uh, uh, next is freedom of speech. The, uh, the next is harassment of stalking. And uh, harassment and stalking are prohibited over internet platform as well. Cyber laws protect the victims and uh, prosecute the offender against this offense. And uh, IT Act 2000 went through amendment under IPC in the year 2008. These were made in light of the laws on cyber crime. IT Act 2000 by way of the IT Act 2008, they were enforced at the beginning of 2009 to strengthen the cyber security laws. And the next is, uh, these are the main provisions um, related to electronic governance, which is a legal recognition of electronic records, uh, legal recognition of digital um, signature, uh, use of uh, government and its agencies. I'm not explaining uh, in detail. And the next slide is, Uh, this is the provision relating to uh, issue of digital signature certificate. Uh, uh, it is regarding application of certifying authority. Application must be accompanied by uh, fee not exceeding 25,000 rupees. A certification practice statement also needed. And the next is um, this is the these are the some provisions of cyber crimes in the IT Act 2000 and. Um, uh, there is a, um, a crime and uh, its penalty shown in this table and damage to a computer or computer system uh, it's a crime and it is punishable for a penalty of compensation not exceeding one crore rupees to the affected person and uh, the next is tampering with the computer source document and imprisonment up to three years or a fine of uh, up to five lakhs and also and for the crime hacking of a computer system uh, it's a, get a penalty of imprisonment of up to 3 years or fine of rupees uh, up to rupees 5 lakhs rupees uh, and in some cases both the, both the um, penalty uh, penalty and the imprisonment will be uh, get the uh, party and publishing obscene information in an electronic form. In case of the first conviction, imprisonment of uh, up to three years and a fine of rupees five lakh, and the subsequent convictions in uh, imprisonment of up to five years and a fine of rupees uh, ten lakhs rupees, and the publication with the intention of fraud, it will get imprisonment up to uh, two years or a fine of rupees uh, one lakh, and also. <coughs> both in <coughs> some cases and securing unauthorized access to a protected system it will get a punishment of uh, imprisonment of rupees uh, imprisonment up to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine as prescribed by the act and the misrepresentation of material facts it, it, it will also get the imprisonment of up to two years or a fine up to one lakh or both and breach of confidentiality and privacy and uh, imprisonment up to two years uh, or fine of up to uh, one lakh rupees uh, also uh, in both cases and publishing a false digital signature certificate in particular it will get a punishment or penalty of imprisonment of up to rupees up to uh, two years or a fine of uh, up to one lakh rupees uh, and some cases both will uh, both the uh, penalty will get and the next slide, please. Uh, it's a, a, a table showing the penalty for default and uh, for failure to furnish any document written uh, 
or report to the controller or the certifying authority, it will get a 1.5 uh, lakh for each default. And for failure or uh, to file any return to furnish any information, um, books or other documents within the specified time, and uh, it's a penalty of rupees 5 lakh for every day during which the such failure continues. And for failure to maintain books of accounts on records, rupees 10,000 for every day during uh, which the failure continues. And for the contra uh, contravention of any rules or regulations for which no specific penalty has been separately provided. And the person who contravenes uh, shall be liable to pay a compensation not exceeding rupees 25,000 to the person affected by such contravention or a penalty uh, not exceeding rupees uh, 25,000. These are the penalty for default. And the next is, uh, there are some amendments made on this act and the uh, IT Act 2000 was amended in 2008 and the amendment introduced the uh, controversial section 66A into the act and 66A deals with the, uh, the authorities, the, uh, gave the authorities the power to arrest anyone accused of posting content on social media that could be uh, deemed uh, offensive. And this amendment was passed in the parliament without any debate. And as per the said a section, uh, a person could be convicted if proved on the charges of sending any information that is grossly, grossly offensive or has a menacing character. And it also made it an offense to send any information that the sender knows to be false but for the purpose of annoyance, inconvenience, danger, obstruction, insult, injury, criminal intimidation, enmity, uh, hatred or ill will through a computer or electronic device. The penalty uh, prescribed for the above uh, was uh, up to three years imprisonment with fine. And the next slide please. Section 60, 69A. Section 69A empowers the authorities to intercept, monitor, or decrypt uh, any information generated, transmitted, received, or stored to any computer resource if it is necessary or expedient to do so in the interest of the sovereignty or integrity of India, defense of India, and the security of the state, friendly relations with the foreign states or public order or for uh, preventing incitement to the commission of any co uh, cognizable offences or for investigation of any offence. And it also empowers the government to block internet sites in the interest of the nation. Uh, the law also uh, contained in the uh, procedural safeguards for blocking any site. When the parties opposed to the section stated that this section violated the right of privacy, uh, the Supreme Court contended that uh, national security is above individual privacy and the Apex Court upheld the constitutional validity of the section also uh, in the uh, law. And in re uh, recent beginning, uh, recent banning of the certain Chinese apps was done, uh, uh, the provisions under section 69A of the IT Act. And the next slide please. Uh, the next is the Right to Information Act and uh, from the uh, IT Act and Right to Information Act uh, there are some um, questions uh, were asked in the previous exam and it is a mechanism uh, for handling citizens grievances and a Right to Information Act is a mechanism to make the government responsible and accountable to its citizens. And it is an act of parliament dealing with the rules and procedures to allow citizens to have a access of uh, government information and it was uh, implemented in the year 2005. A right to information movement was initiated in Rajasthan by Mastur Kisan uh, Shakti Sankadan in early 1990s to fight against the local corruption and uh, exploitation and the uh, right, uh, uh, right to information act 2005 replaced the freedom of information Act 2002 and this act override the official secrets act 1923. And this uh, official uh, secrets act uh, 1923 uh, have uh, the provision of um, non-disclosure of some uh, information. 
and the, those act that uh, this act overrides the rules uh, in the uh, in uh, that particular act and the objectives of the rti act uh, it empower uh, the citizens to question the government and to uh, the act promotes the transparency and accountability in the working of the government and this act also helps in containing corruption in the government and uh, work for the people in a better way and the act envisages building better informed citizens who would uh, keep necessary vigil about the uh, functioning of the government uh, machinery and the next is next slide is um uh, it's a uh, it's regarding the information right to information act under the right to information act information is defined under section 2f and which which uh, defines the information means any material in any form including uh, records uh, documents uh, memos emails opinions advices press releases circulars orders log books contracts reports papers samples models data materials held in any electronic form and information relating to any private body which can be assessed accessed by a public authority under any other law for the time being in force and um, section 21 defines record includes any document manuscript and file and any microfilm microfiche and uh, um, first a smile uh, uh, copy of the uh, fax mail copy of the document and any reproduction of uh, image or images embedded in such microfilm uh, and any other material produced by a computer or any other devices and uh, i think it uh, from this part also some questions were asked in the previous uh, net exam and the next slide is Uh, right to information section 2j defines uh, right to information means the right to information accessible under this act which is held by uh, or under the control of any public authority and includes the right to uh, inspection of work uh, documents records and taking notes extracts or uh, certified copies of documents of records and taking uh, certified samples of materials and obtaining information in the form of um, diskettes uh, floppies uh, tapes videos cast video cassettes or any um, other electronic mode or through printouts uh, where such information is stored in a computer or in any other devices and this section implies into the information can be in any form so that the public can have access to it and the uh, next slide please Uh, uh it is regarding the non disclosure of information the public authority is liable to disclose all the information as per the section 2f 2i and 2j of the uh, uh, right to information act 2005 but um, there are some information which can't be disclosed to maintain the secrecy which may, which are mentioned as an exemption under rti act which are as follows information uh, disclosure of uh, which is the sovereignty and integrity of india and the security uh, of the state uh, which is um, defined under section 8 of the act and the information which involves uh, infringement of uh, copyright subsisting in a person other than the state and uh, the intelligence and the security organizations or any uh, information furnished by such organization to government these are the non disclosure information regarding the Uh, coming under the uh, come under the right to information act 2005 and the next one is uh, the provisions of this act and the legislation provides all uh, citizens the freedom and the right to access information from all the public authorities at union state and grassroots level and public sector undertakings within uh, union and state of governments and or it's uh, it make public authority obligated and legally bound to provide information to the uh, public and the act provides for the uh, establishment of central information commission and uh, that is um, uh, central information com uh, commission uh, includes the chief information commissioner and uh, information commissioners more not less than 10 or 10 uh, information commissioners and the state information commission and the and mandates appointments of public information officer is 
in every department is to uh, provide uh, information for citizens and the cic's and sic's sis looks uh, uh, into the complaint of non appointment of information officer refusal of information by officer um, etc and has the power of a civil court and the next slide uh it, uh, the act also fixes a deadline of 30 days to provide information and 48 hours if it is concerned with the matters of the life and liberty of a person and it carries a strict penalty for not providing information uh, uh for rupees uh, 250 to uh, 25000 as the case may be and the exemption regarding this are intelligence and security organization information affect to the security sovereignty and integrity of india information constituting a contempt of court causing breach of privilege of parliament and the state legislature and commercial uh, information of psus and the next is next uh, next slide please um, these are the important provisions uh, uh, under the act um, a 2h defines public authorities mean all authorities and bodies under the union government and state government or local bodies the civil societies that are um, substantially uh, funded directly or indirectly by the public funds also fall within the ambit of rti and section 4 deals with the um, government has to maintain proactively to disclose the information and section 6 deals with the procedure for securing information 7 deals with the uh, uh, time frame for providing information uh, by the uh, public uh, information officers and it eight deal, uh, deals with the information exempted from the disclosure as i mentioned earlier and the section 82 provides for disclosure of information exempted under the official secrets act uh, 1923 and the section 19 it's a two-tier uh, mechanism for appeal and section 20 provides penalties in uh, case of failure to provide information on time incorrect incomplete or misleading or distorted information 23 deals with the uh, lower court are barred from entertaining suits or applications um, however the writ uh, jurisdiction of the supreme court of india and the high court under article 32 and 226 of the constitution remains unaffected and uh, the next slide please uh, this is the significance of the rta act and the next slide please uh, these are the recent amendments made under the um, rta act 2005 and the amendment bill uh, the amendment was made in 2019 the amendment bill presented in lok sabha on 19 july 2019 and uh, it is passed by the parliament on 25th july 2019 and it became an amendment act with effect from 24th of october 2019 and the amendment act replaced the tenure from uh, fixed from a uh, five year to three years and the salary of uh, chief information commissioner um, is fixed as rupees two lakh fifty thousand, and the central information commissioners is it is fixed as two two lakhs twenty five thousand, and the state information commissioner and the information commissioners is uh, two lakh twenty five thousand, and the right to information act nineteen uh, also states that if any person at the time of joining as a uh, chief information commissioner and information commissioners receiving pensions or any other retirement benefits for previous government services then their salaries will be reduced by an amount equal to the uh, pension and the current uh, chief information commissioner is sudhir bhargava and the uh, ne next slide is um, it is uh, regarding the right to information and right to privacy and next slide please uh, this is intellectual property rights and the intellectual property means an idea, a design, an invention, uh, or a manuscript, etc., which can ultimately give rise to a useful product and application. And uh, intellectual property rights is a right of an inventor uh, to derive economic benefits from his intellectual property. And this right is called uh, the intellectual property rights. And the next slide, please. Uh, objectives of branding IPR. Uh, these are the objectives to enhance the performance level of institution 
to give the recognition and the financial benefits to the efforts for the creativity to create a competition among the researchers and institutions for the quality of research uh, to have a return on investment in research to fasten the technology transfer through licensing and other means and the society benefits in the long term because intellectual property protection encourages uh, creation and invention which become available to society at the earliest and the next slide please these are the objectives and the legislations uh, covering uh, IPRs in India is Patent Act 1970, Indian Trademark Act, uh, Indian Copyright Act. Um, these are the uh, various legislations regarding the IPRs. And the next slide, please. Uh, it's uh, about patent. A patent is a type of, uh, from this IPR part, uh, the questions, um, I think uh, one or two questions were asked in the previous question. A patent is a type of intellectual property that gives it the owner the legal right to uh, exclude other uh, from making, using or selling an invention for a limited period of years uh, in exchange for publishing and enabling public disclosure of the invention. And patent are, patents are granted for uh, an invention innovation or improvement uh, in an invention or process product of an invention or a concept uh, and the next slide is uh, the requirements of patents uh, novelty the invention must be a new and should not be already known to the public and uh, inventiveness the invention should not be obvious to a person skilled in the art and uh, should represent an innovation and industrial uh, application and usefulness a subject matter the subject matter of the patent must must have an uh, industrial application either uh, immediate or in the future that is useful to the society or nation and patentability and the uh, subject matter of the patent must be patentable under the existing law and its uh, uh, current interpretation and the fifth one is the disclosure the inventor is required to uh, um, describe his invention in sufficient detail so that the so that a person of normal skill is able to reproduce it so it must be um, described um, very specifically by the inventor and uh, the next slide please uh, property which cannot be patented and a scientific principle or an abstract theory cannot be patented and a discovery of new property or new use of non-substance, a method of agriculture or horticulture, inventions relating to atomic energy are not patentable. These are the uh, things which are not uh, patentable. And the next slide, please. Um, limits of a patent, uh, limits of time and limits of space. Uh, limit of, uh, limitation of time is a patent is valid for a specific period, uh, say 15 to 20 years. And limitation of space is a patent is valid only in the country of its award and not in other countries. That is the limit of a patent. And the next one, please. Uh, next is about uh, copyright. It provides protection for a specified uh, period and uh, only from reproduction of the copyright material. It, however, does not prevent another person from using either the data, either the idea or the information contained in a copyright material. And time duration of copyright is in case of original liter literary, dramatic, musical, artistic work. The duration of the copyright is the lifetime of the author or the artist and 60 years counted from the year um, following the death of the author. And the next slide, please. Um, what can be a protected literary or a dramatic work? Uh, a musical work, an artistic work, a cinematographic uh, film, a sound recording, a photograph, a computer generated work can be uh, protected through this uh, copyright. And the next one, please. Uh, it is regarding the trademark. It's uh, something that protects the simple uh, colors, phrase, um, or sounds or design, etc. From the trademark, there was a question in the previous exam. And um, uh, in simple terms, it includes any color, symbol, graphic, letters, uh, shapes, etc. That is 
uh, that give the uh, product a unique identity. There are various classes of goods under which a trademark can be registered. The legal, legal requirements for registering a trademark include uh, graphical representation and the capability to distinguish the goods or services from the uh, other. And owners of unregistered trademark have limited protection, but they can sue third party for uh, passing off. And the trademark are in a public domain to help consumers uh, for identifying the brand and product. And uh, they come in handy to create uh, a strong and loyal customer base and to set uh, the product apart from uh, similar products, similar goods. And the next slide, please. Uh, just regarding trade secrets. Trade secrets is uh, a EPA uh, strategies, a system or formula or other confidential information of an organization that provides them a competitive advantage in the market. And uh, um, this uh, ba basically means that any information that is sensitive to a company's operation and must uh, be kept confidential uh, for its business interests will constitute a trade secret. And the value of the secret is de derived from the fact that it is, um, it is not open uh, knowledge. And um, in the definition, um, uh, it is explained that it's a formula, process, device, or other uh, business information that is kept confidential to maintain an advantage over the competitors. And uh, um, it is the information which includes formula, pattern, uh, compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that derives uh, independent economic value from not being generally known or uh, readily ascertainable by others who can obtain economic value from its disclosure or use. This is a uh, trade secret. And the next is, next is regarding the Competition Act. Um, the Competition Act 2002 is a law that uh, governs commercial competition in India. It replaced the erstwhile monopolist, monopolies and restrictive trade practice, that is the MRTP Act 1969. The Competition Act aimed to prevent activities that have an adverse effect on competition in India. A, a new law called the Competition Act 2002 has been enacted to replace the uh, extant law, MRTP Act 1969. And the new law has been amended the 10th September uh, on 10th September 2007 by the Parliament. And an act to provide keeping in view of the economic development of the country for the establishment of a commission to prevent practices having adverse effect on competition, to promote and sustain competition in markets, to protect and the uh, interest of consumers, and to ensure freedom of trade carried by uh, one uh, by the participants in the market. Uh, and for uh, matters connected there with the with or incidental there too. This is uh, the Competition Act. In the next slide, please. Um, this is the history uh, regarding the Competition Act has emerged. And the next slide, please. Uh, this is the objective. Uh, these are the objectives uh, of the Competition Act which eliminate the practice having adverse effect on competition, which promote and sustain competition in markets, protect consumers' interest, ensure freedom of trade carried on by other participants in markets in India. And the next slide, please. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this shows some definitions under the Competition Act. Uh, first one is acquisition. Acquisition is defined as the direct or indirect agreement to acquire shares, voting rights, or control of assets over any enterprises. And the cartel is a, defined as an association of producers, sellers, who limit control, distribution, sale, or promotion on goods through an arrangement previously made. And a position, a dominant position means a position of power held by an enterprise in the related market. It enables uh, the enterprise to function freely and influence the market to its uh, directions and predatory pricing is uh, pricing where the price of goods and services is reduced to well below the cost of production in order to eliminate competition and uh, rule of reason and the interpretation of activity on the basis of business justification market impact on competition and uh, on the consumer 
these are the uh, various terms defined under the competition act and the next slide please uh the these are the salient features of uh, the competition act um uh the uh these are the anti agreements abuse of dominant position combinations uh, competition commission in uh, of india these are the salient features i am not uh, explaining it in the next slide please uh, the act mainly covers the following activity aspects uh, which is prohibition of anti competitive agreements prohibition of abuse of dominance regulation of combination that is acquisition merger amalgamation of uh, certain size and establishment of uh, competition commission of india and power and functions of the competition commission of india uh, this act mainly covers these aspects and the next slide please uh, the next is on uh, goods and services tax uh, gst uh, is a comprehensive indirect tax levy on manufacture sale and consumption of goods as well as services at the national level it will replace um, all indirect taxes levied on goods and services by the indian uh, central and state governments the law will replace various indirect taxes with the one simple tax creating a boundary less uh, and a unified national market for market that will also lead to increase in country's gdp and the, next please uh, it's a historical background of uh, gst during the phase of 2002 2005 indian indirect tax structure was also witnessing the historic change in the name of vat what in india is uh, was introduced at the central uh, level first uh, it was introduced in introduced in 18 uh, 1986 for few commodities which were then called mod uh, mod vat and which was later um, extended to other commodities and uh, stages hence renamed as sen vat with effect from 1st april 2000 after the implementation of vat at central level uh, government of india was uh, keen to introduce a vat at the state level this implementation somehow uh, overshadowed uh, the discussion on gst and uh, its discussion uh, is based on the vijay kelkar task force 2004 strongly recommended that the integration of indirect taxes into the form of gst in india and apart from the kelkar recommendation discussion on uh, gst were uh, silent until 2006 and the science was uh, the silence was broken by the former finance minister uh, p chidambaram in his uh, budget speech for the year 2006 7 he indicated that uh, the need to for the country need for the uh, country to converge from existing system to the national gst and the next slide please um Uh, the responsibility of preparing a design and roadmap for the seamless implementation of gst was assigned to empowered committee of the state uh, ministers uh, state finance ministers the committee released its uh, discussion paper on uh, 10th november 2009 and the finance minister sri um, uh, pranab mukherjee in the budget speech of the year 2010 11 announced that the gst will be rolled out by uh, april 2011 and constitution uh, uh, bill was introduced in uh, 22nd march 2011 and the same was referred to parliamentary standing committee on finance for discussion and with the new government in charge in uh, 1 uh, 22nd uh, constitutional amendment bill was tabled on lok sabha on 19th december 2004 and it is passed by the lok sabha on 6th may 2015 and um, the final step to the constitution that is the 122nd uh, amendment bill 2014 becoming an act was taken the honorable president of india gave his final assent on september 8 2016 and the constitutional uh, one note uh, first amendment was act uh, came into force which empowers both state and center to levy this tax on 1st july 2017 and this is the history regarding Uh, gst implementation and the next slide please um, uh, the benefits of gst it's a transparent tax system and a uniform tax system across india and it reduces tax evasion and export uh, will be more competitive 
and the next slide please uh, these are the components of gst and uh, uh, sale within state and interstate sale are there and sale within state uh, comprises uh, cgst which is uh, central gst and state gst and interstate sale uh, deal in uh, the integrated gst and the next slide please the structure of indian gst is uh, interstate supply and local supply in uh, interstate supply is subject to igst uh, that is uh, integrated uh, gst and the local supply um, is resulted in cgst plus concerned state uh, gst if it is in kerala cgst plus kerala gst is uh, included and the next slide please uh, there are some central taxes to be subsumed under uh, gst these are the central taxes like central excise duty additional excise duty and service tax etc and the next slide please there are some state uh, tax also to be subsumed under gst that is what entertainment tax luxury tax uh, tax on lottery etc and the next one please um, a dual gst in gst uh, in india gst is a dual uh, gst with both central gst and state gst components levied on the same base and only a handful of countries such as Canada and Brazil have a dual uh, GST structure. And compared to a unified GST economy uh, where a tax is collected by the federal government and then distributed to the states. In a dual system, the federal GST is applied in, uh, in addition to the state uh, sales tax. India is a federal country like uh, where both the central and state have separate powers to levy and collect taxes through appropriate legislations and accordingly both the levels of government have distinct responsibilities to perform and the power of uh, to levy tax is drawn from the indian constitution uh, which has been amended through the constitution 101 amendment act 2016 and concurrent powers have been conferred upon the parliament and state legislators uh, through article 246a of the constitution of india to make laws governing gst and the next one please uh, need for dual gst model the need for dual gst model is based on the uh, based on at existing framework both the levels of government as per constitution holds concurrent power to levy tax domestic and uh, domestic uh, goods and services the proposed concurrent dual GST model would be a dual levy imposed concurrently by the center and the state, but independently. Both the center and state will operate over a uh, common base, that is the base for levy and the imposition of duty, tax liability would be incidental. And the next, please. These are some benefits of dual GST. Uh, simple and transparent tax. Dual GST is the best solution for countries like India because it results reduction in the number of uh, taxes at the central and state level and decreasing tax rate and decreasing in the effective tax rate for many goods and a removal of cascading effect that is uh, tax on tax effect is um, removed by GST and reduction of uh, tax uh, transaction cost of the taxpayers through simplified tax compliances and increased tax collection due to wider tax base and better compliances. These are the benefits of dual GST. And uh, next, uh, these are the major provisions um, uh, regarding GST. Um, uh, there is a provision before 1st April 2019 and provision after uh, 2019. The provision regarding the threshold limit for registration was uh, in the case of uh, <coughs> goods in uh, certain um, states in India. That is, um, except persons engaged in market my, making supplies in the state of Ar Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, uh, Puducherry, Sikkim, Telangana, uh, Tripura, Uttarakhand, uh, uh, except these places, uh, it was 20 lakhs and now it is 40 lakhs. And in case of goods and in case of services uh, uh, from the above set uh, states, it was 20 lakhs and now also it was 20 lakhs. And in the case of goods and services engaged in the um, state of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, 
Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Puducherry, Sikkim, Telangana, Tripura, etc. It was 20 lakhs and here now also it was uh, 10 lakhs. And the next slide please. Uh, composition screen uh, regarding the trader manufacturer um, rupees 1.5 crore uh, as of now and the uh, restaurant services it was it is um, 1.5 crore for other service provided subject to threshold limit of the turnover in the uh, preceding financial year rupees 50 lakhs to 1.5 crore and the rate for these are for traders manufacturers is one percentage and uh, for restaurant services, it is 5%. For other services, pro service providers who stand over in the preceding financial year, rupees 50 lakh to uh, 50 lakhs, it is 30% is EGST and 3%. Uh, 3% is EGST and 3% is SGST. And the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. This is the provision um, uh, regarding the supply with the consideration treated as supply under GST, supply with the consideration or supply without consideration. And supply without consideration except activity under Schedule 1, not treated as supply under uh, GST. And I'm not uh, included the uh, supply goods uh, and like um, terminologies in the, in the presentation. You have to uh, prepare or uh, for the exam, including those supply uh, goods and those definitions and TCS provisions for the purpose of determination of value of supply under GST tax collected at source under the provisions of income tax act 1961 would not be includable as it, it is an interim levy not having a character of tax and here uh, is an example of um, the provision and the next slide please this is the uh, regarding the explanation of the uh, table and i think it is over the next one please uh, there are some uh, previous questions regarding uh, this um, topics and most of the questions were asked the, from uh, the contract indian contract act uh, and the uh, rti act uh, the first question regarding uh, this uh, the information Right to Information Act. Um, the definition itself uh, is formed a question that is, uh, which one of the following does not come under the definition uh, information under RTA Act? Here, file notings is the uh, in the process are not included under information. And the next, please. Uh, this is also regarding um, contract of sale. Uh, is not implied condition in a contract of sale. Uh, and the next one, please. Uh, it is Information Technology Act 2000. Uh, there are, I think I, I am included uh, eight or 10 questions in, uh, in the previous question papers. And you can um, refer it. And I will share the PPT if you, if you need it. And uh, this is all about the uh, presentation. Uh, sorry for the uh, time consumption. As you know, it is a very wide topic. And I just give you uh, an orientation. It's not a just, it's not an uh, elaborative one. So uh, kindly uh, uh, adjust for the consumption, over consumption of time. Lakshmi. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, so good evening, everyone. Uh, we have come across another fortunate day of the NT and JRF coaching organized by the Commerce Club, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, Karivatam campus. I'm Jibira JJ, Secretary of Commerce Club and S2 MCOM GBO student. The prosperous ninth day of the coaching imparts me enormous pleasure and with fine privilege I extend my sincere gratitude to our resource person Dr. Anisha P. Chellapin. Uh, Ma'am you've given us a brief idea about the topic. It was a very good session. You've covered all the area and uh, it was a very nice presentation. 
uh, you've included many examples and explanation was also very easy. Uh, all over you have covered the uh, topic in, as a whole and um, yeah, it'll be very easy for us to learn this topic hereafter. So ma'am, you have embellished us with your knowledge. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Next, I thank all the participants for their considerable attention and learning throughout the session. Thank you so much. The next session will be informed in the WhatsApp group and Telegram channel. Once again, I express my, uh, my thanks to everyone. Study and prepare well. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you.